Okay, hi everyone. Um, so today we are rounding off the, um, the this uh, case study in um, the the Grand Jean book. Um, so the 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 chapters we've done recently have been about kind of integrating something called the is it fr uh, framework seven into shiny applications and this was done in the shiny mobile package uh, and we're looking at you know the code that was required to um make the the, the shiny mobile package work basically the previous two chapters we've talked about um progressive web applications and we've talked about the the kind of structure of the shiny mobile um package and um and with that uh we could make a, the kind of outline of a page um integrate all the um the the kind of the um tags that are required to initialize a framework 7 front end and to register the the front end content with the back end via you know javascript talking to shiny and things like that um what we haven't really touched upon is the why that's what why that's a value what tools does the framework 7 front end provide us that we can integrate into our shiny app we have I, I, that probably diminishes what we've actually talked about because what framework 7 has done is made it possible to create apps that will work and and look like native apps on um, a mobile device so they'll be able, you'll be able to install them without a browser so that they can be used without a browser window and they will look to have icons and buttons and a theme that kind of matches the expected design for an app on the the appropriate platform be that a iphone or a ipad or an android phone or a standalone desktop app um yes so that's great that solves some really challenging stuff um but does does doing that mean that we would then have to use a, like a restricted number of user interface controls and things compared to what are available to us via things like shiny itself shiny widgets and the, the the various other um packages that are chiefly designed for making browser based um shiny applications so this chapter is about the user interface components that are made available to you by framework 7 and some of the challenges that were faced when integrating them in the shiny mobile uh, package um so uh as a caveat i would like to say that i found the chapter quite difficult to follow and because i struggled to get um chapter 23 i struggled to get like the framework 7 based r package to to basically work on on my machine and 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 because of that i've not been able to check that the code in the book works in the context of that package um though i have looked at the shiny mobile package itself and there's very similar code to what's described in this book still present for you know the framework seven ages and other ui components and things 
so it uh, you know i i have no doubts that the code works i just couldn't get it to work myself and and as such i'm a little bit uncertain about some of the content in this chapter i was also a little bit uncertain at times what the what the general concept was that we were learning when we were you know reading through the the sections but i think um I mean, the aim of this whole section of the book is to to end up with a working package that will achieve, you know, that will make it achievable to make mobile applications using Shiny. And this chapter addresses some of the challenges to do with making the Framework 7 components available. But it didn't, th it didn't feel like there was an obvious... Um, um, set of um ideas that we were learning while working through it, but that's I don't know. That's probably the balance between a a practical chapter and a kind of conceptual one. Anyway, let's talk about design widgets. So, Framework Seven, um, Framework Seven has a lot of features and um uh and here we're talking about the 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 um the user interface component so you can see on this um the app on the left uh it's possible to include photos from a kind of you know um from a from a photo browser so you know you'd you'd create a mobile application which can integrate with the photo browser on your mobile phone um similarly there are um ui components that that you wouldn't typically expect to see in a browser based thing so like um uh this is kind of floating action buttons so you know if you held your thumb down on the screen for a while something might pop up that uh, you can use for navigation and things similarly there's a um these things here are called gauges they're like um you know you might use them to demonstrate i mean uh my my uh bank application on my mobile has something similar where it shows you know um how much of the money you spent this month where you know came out of a cash point how much went on to you know like reoccurring payments and, and things like that um so it, it's like a way you can either split it up similarly to like a pie chart or you could use it for displaying um the um, what would you call it like how how complete is this operation type stuff anyway so there's a few different things that we can use so if you actually look at framework 7's documentation so what sorry not to get ahead of myself what we're doing here is working out what javascript code and what r code we need to write to make these um ui components workable in a shiny app um and the um <laughs> standard um oh no hold on i think maybe a very empty screen here um so uh let's have a see my app.js um oh, uh, i think there's probably quite a lot of let's have a look at the gauge so th there are a few examples in the in this chapter one is the the how to make the gauge ui component um one is how to make the kind of um notification pops um 
appear. And then there's a more complicated one towards the end. I can't remember exactly what one is. It's tool tips that you might have when the user um, clicks in a particular or, or floats above a, a, a particular element on your app. Right. So the gauge, you need uh, an element on your page that looks like this on your HTML code. Um, then to instantiate a gauge on the page in the JavaScript side, you need to call code that looks like this app.gauge.create, and then you pass in some parameters to it. Similarly, there are ways of updating the parameters on a gauge and uh, presumably removing the gauge from the DOM. Um, there's a bunch of different parameters that you might show, the value being a value between zero and one that shows how far around the circle, the, you know, the, the, um, the, the colored in section should be. Um, so I guess the gauge aren't quite like the example I gave of, of my banking app. It's, it's just one value that's presented in, in here. So, um, anyway, right. So, um, so that was the code for um, creating a gauge. But there's many other types of widget in the um, in Framework Seven. Things like uh, swipers and search bars and um, the the photo browser and things like that. And in almost all cases, you use the same kind of code to um, create the UI component. So you just change this widget here. So previously for the gauge thing, it was app.gauge.create. Here for a typical one, it's you just put in the, the name of the widget. App itself is like a, a global variable that it is added to the it, it, it's a variable that's added to the global namespace in JavaScript by um when we initiate our framework seven based app um so that should be accessible to um to us and we've got these other kind of uh, things update as well that we might use for for changing the, the yeah, we'll not worry too much about nav bars and dialogues. There are all there are um this code doesn't apply to every widget, but it does apply to most. So um yeah, so so you can see in the code from framework seven that in order to create a widget of this type, you need to pass in some parameters. And that's like an object. It's like a key value object, which is similarly to like an R list, but in 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 a JavaScript object. Um. So, what you need is HTML that looks like this, and you it, this tells you this tells the front end that a um, gauge is going to a, a gauge widget is going to be added to the page now we've got some r code to tell us uh, to that we're going to use to um to what we're we doing here is this just making a user interface or is this oh no this is making the user interface and also passing the default values to that widget. So um, you're making a, a gauge object. So you'd use this in the UI code. Um, you'd pass in an ID so that, you know, uh, you can find the, the specific gauge on the page that you're, you're interested in. A value, that's the thing that um, dictates 
how far around the clock face your colored segment goes and and then there's some other options presumably things like the color and and what right so you need to pass those option those that configuration object from r to um to javascript um so first thing we do is we create a config object as a as a text or script um well so the first thing we do is make a, a json object that we can transfer data from r to javascript with so we're taking um gauge props is things like the value and any other options that need to be passed over as as this configuration object um and there's a bit of chicanery to make sure that our objects are converted to values that are compatible with um javascript so where it's expecting a scalar it doesn't receive a vector of length one then we've got some code to add a a div object with class gauge and which is initiated with this gauge config like that and seemingly that is all the code we need to write but i don't think it actually is i think we um we have to do some work on the javascript side as well to um to so what that's doing is taking care of um adding this html element to your page and creating this set of parameters as a json object to be transferred to to javascript um so what have we got there that is so that's a, a user interface element that is attached to the application when it's initiated or you know uh, in in reaction to to some some user uh, request or whatever an element might be added to the page um there are other types of um element that are available in framework 7 that don't need a pre-existing element to be attached to the html of the the page one of which is the notification so uh we talked about toasts a couple of weeks ago toasts are like um um the similar similar to no, notifications i think that I, i'm not entirely certain what the specific difference between the two is but these are like elements that pop up that the user can then swipe away that say things like you know you've disconnected from the server and things that you know that you might see in a, a shiny application and obviously things like error messages you've entered an invalid um value or something like that so these don't need a pre-existing user interface element unlike the gauge um and in order to add them to a and you add you add those elements to a page by um sending a message to the front end from the server so you might do so your your code might look something like this so you've got an id identifier the text that you want to display and um some stuff about it, icons that's, that's not particularly important um so we are constructing the so this is basically identifying uh making the identifier for a, you know 
nested within the module structure of your shiny applications that that, that session dollar ns will make sure that you're constructing a a notification object that is tied to a specific module and so that it's identifier isn't incompatible with what, what you know what already exists on the in the app and then so you're converting that into a message. This is a big list of, of values. Um, and you send that using send custom message with this as the type of message that you're sending over. Okay, so that's two different types of user element. Um, the gauge where you have to, you have to add an HTML element to the um, to the applications, so you know the the, the HTML code and a um, notification object where you don't have to pre-populate the HTML page. But really, all we've done there is send data to JavaScript. We haven't written anything that tells um we haven't written any of the code to handle the messages that are received by javascript um so we need to do that um so we've got this so we're gonna write a um a bit of source code um to to link the two together so we've got a few different types of widgets so we've so we discussed the difference between them these are ui widgets here are things where you would kind of hard code the presence of this element in your user interface code in your shiny application um you know a, a gauge element goes here a, a swiper element goes here and we've got other things like the toast and the notification and the photo browser where they kind of pop up the user interacts with them and then they go away and you don't have to kind of pre-populate their code on the html page um so there's two different types of elements to to handle in this um script right so we need to write the code that will activate those widgets, that will take the configuration data that we've sent from R and know what to do with it to ensure that the object, when shown in the browser or, or in the app itself, it, it, you know, if it's, if it's a kind of native-like app, ensure that the data received from R gets shoved in the appropriate place and the um ui element is made visible to the user okay so we've got two different types of widgets we're going to handle them separately so this little code here just checks whether for a given widget so here a widget is a given oh hold on Is this going to be, this is probably going to be the, if I send the string gauge to this function, it will look for, uh, it will work out how to activate all the gauge elements that are on, that, that you want to display in your app. So it will do it for all the gauges at once, I think um so what we're looking for is working out whether the widget passed in as a string is a user interface or a server um spun up um ui element if it is we do one thing and if it isn't we do something else um now what do we actually have to do hold on let's have a see so 
here. Yeah, so this is what we have to do to create the um the gauge object. And we so we basically need some way of writing code that looks like this that will respond to the data we've passed over. Um, so it has to look like this for a gauge. It has to look like, um, what would it be? App.swiper.create for a swiper element and similarly app.searchbar.create for um, a search bar element. Um, so we've got that. So we need, basically need to write some code that will say app.widgetName.create and pass in the parameters. I think that's right anyway. So what, what have we got here? These are the user interface widgets that we're focusing on to begin with. Widget that gets passed into this function is a string. It might be gauge, it might be slider, it might be um, some other type of widget. What we're doing here with the, the jQuery code here is looking for any element with that particular widget name as its class. So it'll be looking for all elements on the page with a class of gauge dot gauge is like the CSS selector for a element with a class string name equal to, to, to gauge. So we've got find all the widgets that match this particular class on the page. And then for each of them, do something. Um, and what do we actually do here? So if I hold on. Um, no, no, that's not, that doesn't clearly do it. Um, so we're iterating over all, let's assume for now that widget has the value gauge, okay? It's just so that it's easier for me to, to get it in my brain, all right? We're, so we're iterating over each gauge on the page and finding here we're taking the element referred to here is is the whichever widget we're current whichever html element we're working with at the moment and we document so here we're getting the identifier of that element. So for a given gauge, we're pulling out its ID. And then we're looking for um, the, we're looking for a separate element on the page that contains the data that should be populated into that particular element so we're iterating over all the gauges if we find so we go through gauge one gauge two gauge three if the identifier for the first gauge is gauge one we look for some element on there that has a data dash four um thing with gauge one as its um you know, data for string. And the data associated with that that it is used config L. Oh, right. Well that's not quite what I thought. Which dot Yes, right, okay. So um so here we are passing the JSON. So, right. So what happens is R sends over some code 
uh, some some JSON for um, a specific gauge element, and it gets attached as uh, for for gauge one, it will be in some element on the page called with script data dash four equals gauge one. So we're trying to pull out the um, I don't know why it's config.html, but we'll 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 gloss over that. But we're passing the JSON that's passed into that, and we then use that data when we create um hold on no that can't be right config.l presumably framework 7 itself knows what to do when it sees the dot l uh, thing so this code here is the same as like app dot gauge dot create com big um because um this dot here is just a a way of looking into an object in JavaScript. So it's like so this square bracket form is equivalent to the dot gauge form, but you can pass a variable into it. So it's similar to like, you know, dollar subsetting versus square bracket subsetting in R. With dollar subsetting, you have to kind of write out the column name that you're interested in or something. If you if you're subsetting a, a data frame using dollar, whereas if you're using square brackets, you can put the name of the column that you're interested in a variable and then use that variable inside the square brackets. So it's just a, a similar kind of um, um, similar thing to 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 what you've got in R. So this here. Is equivalent to app when widget is gauge, it's equivalent to app.gauge.create config. And that um app.gauge. Sorry, did I is it app.gauge? Yeah, app.gauge.create config. And the parameters um yeah, it doesn't actually tell us, but will contain the identifier for the, the the gauge that we're currently updating, the value for it, and any other options like the color and stuff like that that we need to pass over. Okay. Um, so so we've handled how to instantiate, how to create um, and configure the those elements on the page that require a pre-existing user a pre-existing html element to be present on the page before they can be created now we've got to handle the things like notifications which don't expect a pre-existing um element to be on the page um so what was the code we actually used? Um, so we had F7 notification, some function that s sends over a message of type notification. Um, so the shiny session objects taking that message and, and relaying it over to, to the browser. So we have to now write browser side code that can handle a notification type message and know um, what to do with it. And similarly, uh, presumably, we'll be writing a, uh, what was it again? What are the other things? Um, the photo browser is another similar type object. Yeah, here these kind of things. So you'd have some similar code for toasts and for photo browsers 
as you'd have for notification objects, but we'll use notification as the the kind of example widget here. Um, right. Uh, so the code for um, um, making a framework seven notification object come up. Um, how does it work? We we basically have to tell the browser. Sorry, I keep talking about the browser, but these things aren't necessarily running in a browser because it's a framework seven thing. But the front end side co uh, shiny object has to handle any messages that come to it. So when it receives a notification message, um, it has to be able to handle that and know what to do on the front end. Um, and what it does, value on a fly with shiny.set input value. So we, we are taking the HTML ID for uh, a notification object, and we are setting the value associated with that element to be true when the when the user sends an open um, message to uh, the the the. Kind of small, small like that anyway. So the the message object here will contain an identifier, a on um, value, and then so what we're doing here message on equals oh no sorry we're adding that thing. So this is like. When the notification's opened, we run this code. When the notification should be closed, we run this code. And then we have the same code again. It's like app widget.create with the config value for it. And then you call the open me method on it. So what's happening here, in response to that message, that a notification should be op opened with this particular text as the me as the message that should be displayed in the notification is um the a notification element is created with the configuration values that are stored in that message object. So these are uh, message on is basically some functions of what should this notification object do in response to this event. Um, we've got message ID and that's the the you know the specific element on the page that we want to work with and there is message text as well gets sent over uh where is it now message dot text yeah is the value that the shiny r code that's the 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 code that gets sent over there right um so whew. Right. Does that make sense, though? Um, da, da, da. Yes. So this code here. Yeah, so far, I'm with you. Not easy to parse, but you're. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're gradually building up this activate widget function. So it will um, activate the gauges, the notifications, the photo browsers and things like that. Anything that pre-exists on the page when it's run 
um, will be handled in this block. Anything that is kind of newly added to the page will be handled in this block. Um, and we can actually, um, hold on, widget stuff for each. So this is um, widgets contains the list of like both the UI elements and the um, server side element, so server specified elements. So we got widget stop for each. So the W here would be the string gauge slider notification and so on. Um, and we're activating each of those when you when activate widget is run um we have some code that will where is it uh da, 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 for we'll iterate over each widget of that type and activate it with the relevant config values and whatnot um for i don't know whether there is a kind of iteration over the notifications maybe that wouldn't make sense but um yeah anyway so that's just how you kind of activate the, the things this is uh, some example code to to show how it works well show that it works um yeah um <laughs> it's i don't know it... so if we look at the full oh, what's the book i'll just get so so this code here gets run when your shiny app is initially in a ready state and it populates all the widgets on the page um so the the code we've just seen this is handling things like gauges and swipers and search bars um it finds you know for each for each element that it finds of that particular type it looks for the data that should be injected into that element and then with that data and knowing the identifier of the relevant element it creates a widget of that type with that particular id and the data appropriate for that id um i don't know quite what's going on here i didn't quite get to that but um that's something to do with caching the the the, the contents um uh whereas for things that are kind of added sporadically added in a kind of you know on and off kind of way um you um handle well you're still handling each widget type in turn and whenever a message comes in for a, a widget of that type um we da, 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 um add some event handlers to it and create that particular object be it a notification or a photo browser or something like that then um so that sorry that's just a function um once that function is defined we can use it to ensure that all the widgets that will be used by the app are um activated such that you can add them and take them away and things um 
there is code for like updating the values at, attached to them, but I, I mean, in some ways, it's very similar to the code that you've used to to create the um, object. So I'm not going to go through that. But yeah, I read through this chapter a few times, and because I wasn't able to get the like, I wasn't able to build the package myself like sorry i wasn't able to write the package myself based on the example code in the um the book and it's it's repo um yeah i was a bit in the dark as to you know why certain things were being done and i, I read read the chapter a few times to try and understand what was going on i was still a little bit in the dark as to why things were done this particular way um oh i don't know i think my struggling through it for the past hour has probably helps cement the ideas a little bit um there is a, a, another section in here on updating the values associated with widgets and there's another section on like a more advanced tooltip type um widget but i i i i, I think I was kind of already at my limit with just initializing the widgets, really. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, so presumably you would have to write similar kinds of code were you to create a shiny framework, a, a shiny kind of mirror of of some other ui framework um and some of the kind of um stumbling blocks for framework 7 will in will be useful when if if you attempt to do it for i don't know what i mean i, I don't know of any frameworks that haven't already been implemented by the guy who wrote this book like or by absalon or or, or someone um if there if there ever is one, um it's it's code similar to what's gone on in the past few chapters that that will be required to link R to JavaScript and make sure that things can be created, updated, destroyed and and whatnot. But it always seems quite funny when I read this code because it, it seems like like it just seems weird that you're iterating over I, I, something similar happened in the JavaScript for our book last year where um, where rather than you where you basically you don't know the identifiers of the elements that you're interested in working with. So you have to iterate over the the, the different classes of element on the page and then for each of those when you've got those that collection of elements you can then filter the identifiers to find that which matches the thing you're trying to manipulate and it seems kind of it, it always seemed kind of backwards to me but I, it's it's it, I, it certainly comes from a certain ignorance of mine as to how to write this kind of code but it I, I just imagined that you'd be able to just find an element with a particular ID and then work with that um, in the same way that I can when I'm working in the, you know, the the, the dev tools um, console. Like, um... um but yeah, uh, I don't know. So, uh, what, what would that be? If ID equals mobile widgets update. Like, I uh, yeah, I I don't know. I mean, it, it just seems strange because I imagine, as the developer, you should have specified the identifiers for the objects that you want to work with. So why you can't just, 
but I guess the package developer doesn't know the identifiers that the app developer is going to use, and that's the 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 main kind of stumbling block, isn't it? Um, anyway, yes, it was a very yeah, complicated. Seems, seems so. That, that that does seem like a weird weird. I, I agree with you. I had the same reaction. It seems like a weird way of doing things, but I guess it was almost like the JavaScript is there, uh, like. It, it it knows it knows it can't reasonably know anything about your about your about your DOM, right? So mm. it, it doesn't have a means. I mean, unless unless it seems like there's uh, some way that somehow like the UI could like pass the ID to uh, something in JavaScript and pass it on to that function instead of having like traverse the whole yeah. you know like DOM and look for look for objects of a certain class. I don't know. It, it, it seems it seems weird, but I guess I guess I understand from the JavaScript perspective that if you know nothing about the doc document that's that's uh, you know that's past you, I mean I guess that maybe you don't have any other choice. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, but these, um, it does seem awkward. Yeah. It makes for a lot yeah. of boilerplate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. Uh, okay. So um, next week. Uh, we have chapter 26, which is the final chapter of this section, but it is three or four pages long. So what I was going to propose was we work through that chapter, but we also, I'll try and do a kind of demo creating an app using the actual Shiny Mobile package. Because... Um, Though this section of the book has been very useful in terms of like seeing how to actually implement this kind of thing, from my perspective, I just want to use things that better developers have already produced. To be honest, sometimes and really, my my um my experience on the in the JavaScript front and world is considerably <laughs> more narrow. <laughs> then um so uh, yeah so i think maybe we'll just build out a relatively simple app using shiny mobile i don't think it will be possible to make a you know progressive web app using it in the time between now and next week but certainly we'll be able to write an app that has gauges and that has um um, sliders and things like that and just to see you know how yeah whether there are points where you think i you know i i wish i still had access to the more typical shiny ui elements and things um yeah anyway if that's cool i think that's what we'll do um that sounds good. Yeah. And then there's a week off because it's the um Posit conference um in two weeks' yep. time. Um and then we'll start up and you're uh uh the the, the Arthur, you're doing chapter twenty seven on React. I think that's right, yeah, on React. Yeah. Yep. Cool, cool. Brilliant. Um yeah, anyway, good to see you both. Um I will um I'll speak to you next week then. Yeah. <laughs> good to see you. Thanks, thanks so much for walking us through this chapter. Uh, <laughs> That's all right. I, I, it was I, a don't bit think, of a struggle. I, don't, I don't think I could have done so. <laughs> <laughs>